Hello and welcome to The Premise. Bienvenidos, mi amigos. I'm Jennifer Thompson. And I'm Chad Thompson. And this is, what, season three? Season three. Wow. We are in season three of getting to the story behind the storyteller. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we do. That's what we do here on The Premise. So sit back, relax. Listen. Listen to your eight tracks. I dig you like an old soul record. <laughs> Enjoy a cup of tea, a glass of wine, a shot, you know, whatever. And you do you. You do you. We'll do us. No judgment here. We'll do us. <laughs> Hello and welcome to The Premise. I'm here today with, well, Chad, of course. Hello, Chad. Hello. And I'm very excited. Mark Gottlieb, welcome to The Premise. Thank you both so much for having me on here. Yeah, I'm really excited about this conversation. I got to meet Mark virtually, as we mostly do these days, our virtual world of meetings, in a class I took from you that was really awesome. And you're just so generous and have so much information. I thought our guests are going to love to hear from Mark. So thank you so much. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, mm. it was a great workshop. So I'm going to read Mark's official bio, and then we'll dive right in. Mark Gottlieb is a highly ranked literary agent, both in overall deals and other individual categories. Using that same initiative and insight for identifying talented writers, he is actively building his client list of authors. Mark Gottlieb is excited to work directly with authors, helping to manage and grow their careers with all of the unique resources that are available at Book Publishing's leading literary agency, Trident Media Group. Through his work at Trident Media Group, Mark Gottlieb continues to represent numerous New York Times best-selling authors, as well as major award-winning authors, and has optioned and sold books to film and TV production companies. He previously ran the agency's audiobook department, in addition to working in foreign rights. In his free time, Mark Gottlieb tutors free English language classes to adults from low-income immigrant families via the Literacy Volunteers Program at Family Centers, a nonprofit organization offering education, health, and human services. He is actively seeking submissions in all categories and genres and looks forward to bringing new and established authors to the curious minds of their future readers. I like that. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that with everyone. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, sometimes I'll cut a bio, but I thought this is all so good. And I want our listener to know, our listeners, to know all about you. Thank you. I feel like as I, I age, uh, my bio gets longer. <laughs> that happens if we're doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what you're saying is I've been doing it wrong for the past 20 years. I guess so. Has your bio not gotten My longer? My bio just kind of stops. At <laughs> well, <fun. laughs> to the, the most salient things, you know, it's sometimes best to keep it simple. They give you a byline in articles, right? One That's right. Yeah. yeah. And Chad, you're lying. You're, you're the co-host of The Premise. That's not in your bio. Oh, I guess I should add that then. <laughs> This is one of the biggest pieces of advice I give my authors mm. is to remember to update your bio. You know, we, we forget to connect the dots of our success. Mm. And the bio is your introduction to the world, right? So if we don't know about all the awards or things you've published, or if you were the co-host of a podcast, mm -hmm. Chad, mm -hmm. but authors forget to do this. So yeah, authors, remember, go take a look at your bio. Make sure it's as good as Mark's. Hey, yeah, wear those badges proudly. <laughs> that is right. That is right. So, Mark, how long have you been a literary agent? So I've been at Trident for a little over 10 years. Before mm. that, I was at Penguin Books for a time. I did art and production there um, across a number of imprints for uh, Putnam and Riverhead and, and uh, you know, among a lot of different authors of theirs. And um, Cool. Yeah, at Trident, I've been, you know, representing a lot of clients of my own. Um, there's uh, quite a mixture of, of authors at the agency and among my clients um, between fiction, nonfiction, children's books and graphic novels, you name it. Wow. Is that, I don't know, when I hear of an agent who says, I take all genres, I'm like, really? Because it seems like it would be more work. Or uh, yes. is that not true? Yes, I think that's true. I mean... 
the thing is, a lot of agents in starting out, they um, some of them just want to follow whatever their passions are, whatever they read for pleasure, mm. and they make their work a direct extension of that, which is easy to understand. You know, other agents might feel like, um, I want people to come to know me for my brand of representation. So I'm the de facto person you go to if you've written, I don't know, a uh, women's fiction novel or sci-fi or a thriller. You know, that's the person you go to if you've written that. And so I can understand people want to kind of brand their representation. But I always figured that my brand of representation would be, you know, my style of working with authors and publishers, people would come to know me by my style of working together as, as my own brand of representation. And, you know, I don't like to limit myself in any way. I like to have a lot of um, choices in terms of how I work with, with authors and publishers. Mm. And if, if there's something I can't do, I'm, I'm always happy to put it with a colleague here at, at the agency where I work. Nice. Yeah. Well, you know, that brings up an interesting point going back just a little bit. So if I represent, you know, a certain genre, a certain style of book, maybe that would make my life harder as an agent, because we have relationships in this business, right? So if you've already sold this book to a publisher, now you need to find a different publisher to sell your second book. So could that be even more difficult than having a lot to work with? Uh, I mean, a lot of it, yes, is relationship driven, you know, in terms of the editors we know and, and work with and understanding a certain space of book publishing. You know, there are probably some more minute spaces of publishing I wouldn't wouldn't necessarily work in. Um, but, you know, I don't want to really preclude myself from anything. So, um, you know, I would say that um, it's definitely a big part of it, the relationships, knowing what publishers are publishing, what their lists look like. Um, but you can't, I don't think you can um, ever let an author's life stagnate for that reason. One of the reasons why I wanted to work across different genres was what do I do, for instance, if a, if a client comes to me and they've been writing historical fiction all this time and I, I had made myself out to be the historical fiction agent <laughs> and then they say, I want to start writing children's books. Right, then, yeah. What do I do? So yeah, this opens up possibilities for my clients is, is how I see it. And that's awesome. Yeah, definitely. If I have a relationship with an agent, I would hope they would take my nonfiction and my, and my fiction. Right. You know, recently, I just got back from a writer's conference, actually, my first in-person writer's conference, which was exciting and also kind of scary because no one had masks on. But one of the authors had said, you know, when I was in a query writing class again, you know, checking everyone out, seeing what everyone has to say. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, in the acknowledgments, of course, you're going to find who agented this book. So when you find your comp title, your comparable title, you don't want to go after that agent. They just sold that book. Why would they want yours? They already have that book. Hmm. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. What, well, what... it's one way to go about it. It's a, it's kind of a old-fashioned pre-internet way if you ask me mm, i like that answer you know i remember walking into to barnes and noble and like you would open up the pages of a book to have to find that nowadays people use a lot of websites like publishers marketplace where mm. you know a lot of kinds of industry news and industry deals are announced and it's basically an online rolodex of people in publishing they keep a tally on all the the uh, book deals in publishing and you can search through there and find an agent based on like, okay, if you search, let's say you feel like your book is similar to, I don't know, Gone Girl or something, mm -hmm. you can find like the agent or agency that worked with that or has similar clients and you can break it down into different categories and things. Um, and and lo in looking at the raw data, you know, you can really see a ranking of agencies in terms of vo volume of deals, mm -hmm. amount of money for deals. So. Uh, for instance, our agency ranks first on there in not just overall volume of deals, but actual you know money for deals cons and consecutively since uh, the year 2000, which is when they began recording this stuff on Publishers Marketplace. So in clicking into that information, you can get the person's name, you can look at the deals they've done and with which editors at which publishing houses, um, and then you have their contact details. So I think that's a kind of a better way to go because 
otherwise there's too much other information online where people could be pulled in a bunch of different directions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have this idea for a strategy for finding my favorite agent or my, you know, the best agent for me that I'd like to run by you. So I'm a new author and I've got three lists. I've got my, my top tier of, you know, the, my dream agent, my middle tier who would be great. And then sort of the, the third tier, which would maybe even easier to access their newer. And then I pitch in the opposite order. So I pitch my top tier, then wait a little bit, my second tier, and then my third. Hmm. So the idea is that maybe the third tier, someone says yes. And then you go back to your top tier and say, hey, I got a bite. Do you want to reconsider uh, or take a look at me? So what do I'm you think impressed. of that strategy? <laughs> I've never heard that before, but it's pretty genius. <laughs> I like the way you think. Do you think it can backfire, though? Like if I go to my top tier and say, hey, you know, I got a bite. Do you think well, they would be feel pressured? Or? Uh, I mean, I could say a couple things about it. First of all, I conduct my submission strategies in a similar way. A long time ago, I thought... Well, I'm just going to go to the big five publishers, and if they pass, I, I suppose I can work my way down a list among publishers. And what I found was there wasn't a lot to light a fire under people. Mm -hmm. And so what I started doing was casting a very wide net in my submissions. And what happened was oftentimes these smaller publishers, you know, they don't have huge workloads or they want to get out ahead of the big guys. So they read quickly, they make an offer, and then that's an opportunity for me to mm -hmm. quietly but respectfully go back to the other publishers and say, hey, you know, we have an offer in, I'm not saying from who or how much <laughs> to respect everyone's privacy, yeah, but yeah. you might want to make an offer of your own. Yeah. You know, they don't know where it's coming from. It could be coming from Penguin Random House for all they know. So um, that um, strategy I have found works. And I would think as an author, I mean, yes, the strategy you're, you're mentioning makes sense, but I think in just casting a wider net, going to everyone at once, mm -hmm. Um, you'll get a lot more interesting results and could probably end up with, with something like what what I described. But I, I like that idea of kind of like reverse engineering the process. It's, it's also very smart. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would say being on the receiving end of that, you know, what I usually say to people is, you know, personally, I'm the kind of person who reads very quickly and tries to get back to people to show my level of interest. And, you know, in making an offer of representation, if they say to me, well, okay, there are other agents considering what should I do? I usually say to them, I think, I think the professional courtesy would be, you know, if, if I were in their shoes and you pretty much have your mind made up, uh, you know, the next best answer to yes, believe it or not, would be no, but probably hearing no sooner rather than later. Cause as you can imagine, it's, it's time out of everyone's lives to read, to consider. Yeah. And, it's almost like an author's not going to get a better deal, I think, going from one publisher to the, uh, excuse me, one agency to the other. We all do the same thing on our essence. We keep uh, the same commission structure, which follows industry practices and norms. Um, so it, it may come down to other things for an author, like personality, or do they want to be with like a really big powerhouse, just heavy hitting kind of agency like ours, or... Do they, for some reason, think they might be better served in a boutique agency setting, which mm. I don't believe is always the best, you know, case scenario for authors? Yeah. Yeah. I have so many questions from that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the first one I think that maybe our listeners would be interested in is what does that commission structure look like? So typically, most every agency will, will do 15% domestically. So any deals they do in the U.S. And then they have a commission structure for the international markets overseas. It's typically like 20% in the U.K. in the major markets and then 25% in what we call the these tertiary markets or co-agent territories, basically small countries where, you know, we have to work with an outside agency that understands the language, the culture that can help us sell into those markets. And it just basically makes it so we can we basically break even in those places because mm. of how hard it is to do business in those places. They mm. pay lower advances and, you know, they're, the readership isn't like as big as it might be in Germany or the UK. Right. So that's typically what the commission structures look like among most agencies. And um, we list our 
commission structure on our website because we know it follows industry practices and norms. So we're very transparent about that. You know, there's no smoke and mirrors there. That's awesome. And that should be the case for any agent you're working with, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no they should smoke and mirrors. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope so. You hear about books, you know, this has been published and translated into, you know, 26 languages and that process. So that's what you're talking about is that process of getting it translated in, in foreign rights, correct? Yeah, getting a book sold overseas to an international publisher who will, you know, translate it and publish it in their market. When those books are translated, I, I just have to wonder, like, the author doesn't actually know how it's translated. That's the funny thing. Uh, you know? <laughs> it's a peculiar business. Mm -hmm. um, the publisher usually hires the translator, and then the translator actually owns the copyright with respect to the translation that mm. they provide to the publisher. That explains um, why commission or royalties are lower, I would guess. There's so many people involved. Well, yeah. I mean, anytime you do business overseas, the, the cost goes up exponentially because you have, you know, not just foreign bank fees, but the different tax structures. And then you have um, the cost of translation overseas, which is, you know, you have to figure in, okay, so the publisher has not just the same cost we have here of, you know, shipping, warehousing, manufacturing, whatever, Add to that the cost of translation, which can be enormous. And with the interesting thing about translating a book is you probably see anyone who speaks another language or seen another language, when you translate a sentence, sometimes you can add as much as three to five words depending on the language. So right. that that pushes up the cost of the translation. It pushes up the cost of the book. Yeah. More pages. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, my gosh. It's all incredibly fasc fascinating. And, and you... <laughs> You were in charge of foreign rights at Trident for a while, is that right? You I wasn't in charge of foreign rights. I, I worked directly under the director of foreign rights. Okay. Um, so I helped her oversee basically, yes, all of the foreign rights business at Trident where where we were selling books to international publishers. And, Very cool. Uh, it was a great place to start, you know, because you it's kind of like a, I think of it as like the Trident boot camp. You just really get to know... <laughs> all of our list um yeah. Yeah. yeah i think one of my what is the most fascinating to me is that when your book is translated and sold in another country they always change the cover because the audience expects something different you know it yes. needs to fit squarely in the genre as we like to say yes and you know that publisher gets to choose that cover uh sometimes oh okay okay Usually, we have very good contracts with publishers and we actually write our contracts with foreign publishers so they use our contracts oh. uh, rather, normally you would use the publisher's contract but anyway we get a lot of consultations and approvals for our clients over things like the cover and the title because you're right oftentimes in foreign markets they have a different sensibility there mm -hmm. so they'll change the book cover to something that makes sense in their market or it, I've seen them change the title because certain things just don't translate or don't right. make sense in their language. So, and you almost, I mean, most authors just kind of sign off on it when they see it because they're like, they, they're thinking to themselves, well, I can't pretend to know what makes sense in that, you know, language or culture if I don't understand it. So they, yeah. they, they tend to kind of go with it. Mm -hmm. It's only in the rarest of instances I've seen people kind of push back hmm. against it. This really is a good argument for why it's so important to know the agent and the house they're with, you know, their policies and how they handle things like foreign rights. You know, are you going to be protected? And do you really trust the, the processes that the, the house and their agents use? Um, yeah, I mean, to have that transparency is very good. We, um, you know, when we began actually at Trident, uh, or when I began at Trident, I should say, you know, it's my family business where I work and they brought me in and I was seeing the way things were done and I was just thinking, um, I would want to do some things differently. And so, for instance, at the time, the popular thing to do among literary agencies was you only had a landing page. It would be like if you visited, you know, the yeah. Boy Mars agency's yeah. um, website, it was literally a landing page with a main line. An address and the company logo and that was it 
And a lot of agencies were into that kind of practice because they wanted people to feel like this is an exclusive nightclub. Mm-hmm. Unless you were invited or you know someone, <laughs> you're not getting in. Yeah. And I said to the company controllers, I don't think you know this does a lot of um, good mm-hmm. for um, people. I, I said, let's open all the doors and windows and let people look inside. And so we, we revamped the website. I helped them build the website. And we listed you know, our clients, our titles, the agents, their bios, the about us, the awards, um, and even the, the various departments. So we listed this, the people who work in the foreign rights department, the kind of work they do there, the books they do in, in translation, uh, the same thing with the audio business, the book to film and TV business we do, and even the, you know, the more, I would say, back office stuff that people aren't always interested in, but they realize they also need as a part of their career, like, you know, the accounting, the contracting, the contracts, the uh, digital media and marketing type stuff. So it's all there laid bare for the world to see, you know? That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I've always kind of like got that feeling. And I've been looking at, you know, literary agent websites since the early 2000s myself. And they usually are that the logo and it feels very exclusive. And that's so that's really awesome. You're changing it. Now, did you say that it's a family business? Trident? That's right. So uh, there's no coincidence. The chairman of the company and I have the same last name. I grew up in the book business. Both my parents worked in publishing all my life. Um, And yeah, I guess you could say I was kind of groomed for this. When I went (laughs) to college, I had lots of different ideas of different things I would do, you know, writing among them. um, And you know, my dad said, well, uh, I'm paying for school, you know, you should see if you could go for maybe journalism or something having to do with publishing. And so um, Emerson College actually offered an undergraduate degree in publishing, and I started a small press there. And we helped with the curriculum, and, and we ran a publishing club there and all that. Um, but yeah, it, it being the family business, I like to make that known to you know, new or potential clients because um, I think they feel like, oh, good, I don't have to worry like where my agent will be tomorrow. And <laughs> right, he's not going anywhere. Yeah, right. that's really cool. So yeah, again, I, it's about transparency. But what did you get your degree in? My degree. So uh, at Emerson, they 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 had a strange name for it. They called it a writing, literature, and publishing degree. Yeah. And so. It was it was comprised of really those three parts, and they wanted people to fulfill like an equal course load in, in each area. And it appealed to me because at the time I thought, well, I have really good grades. I went to a good school and all that. You know, my essay was good and and what have you. And I was like, I could go get a degree in comparative literature somewhere, but what good is that going to do me with you know in going into publishing? Yes, I would know books and writing but what would i know of the business or the publishing industry right yeah that's very cool did did you ever consider becoming a writer so originally i i think i went in to emerson for journalism and then i saw they had an undergraduate study for publishing so i switched over to that Um, but i did a lot of writing while i was in school i wrote you know newsletters for different organizations and i did music reviews for a music review website kind of like pitchfork media and um i did um you know some obviously in the classes right they had us do a lot of creative writing uh and then after i kind of switched to it switches to over to the kind of writing i do now is mostly correspondences with authors editorial letters you know publishing articles for instance um publishers weekly magazine every year they publish a book publishing almanac and so for 2022 they invited me to write the chapter on literary agents so uh, i was like well okay what the heck what do you want me to write and they just kind of gave me free (laughs) reign over it so you know had some fun with it well and you're really good at writing hooks and i'm sure that is a combination of being in the business for so long and seeing so many but also being a reader and and having some writing chops, right? It helps, yes, being around um, books and stories and getting a feel for it. When I, I'll admit to you, when um, you know, I was covering someone else's desk as an executive assistant here, and when they had a book deal that needed to be announced, 
I had to think of a way to zero in on the description of the book to one sentence. Mm, and I didn't gross. know how to do it. I was so overwhelmed by taking a, a, an idea as expansive as a book. Right. And it to one sentence. Yeah. And this, it's not even like it was my own book. So I can only imagine how authors feel about this. Mm-hmm. Um, but you get a feel for that over time and it comes a lot more naturally. And when you see it in a perhaps a, a query letter from an author, you can pull that information out a lot more easily. Yeah, over time. So I did, I had mentioned in the beginning that I took a class from you. I think it was from Writer's Workshops, but I, mm-hmm. could, be, I could be wrong. Okay. Yep. And it was so helpful to like, because mm-hmm. everyone got to read their hook and then everyone had feedback Mm -hmm. about how it could be better and you know how it could be more clear Mm -hmm. and i loved it and i would just recommend anyone who's listening if you can take a class from mark do it oh thank you that's so kind of you to say well it's not i'm i mean it was fantastic i'm not just being kind i'm being honest and you spent so much time you went over and i don't i don't think you should do this very often (laughs) because we only have so much time in our days but you went over to make sure you accommodated everyone and everyone felt heard and it was really great yeah yeah i didn't want anyone to feel left out and i will tell you also the people who paid there were some people who paid to go to the workshop and then they couldn't make it so they Mm. just watched the recording of the workshop and then I told them, I said, after, I said, send me the hooks and I'll workshop them with you outside the workshop. Wow. You know? So that went on <laughs> too because I wanted to make sure I got to everyone. Part of that was it's hard to, you not knowing how many students you're going to get and we didn't cap it. Um, and then how much of explaining you want to do versus actual workshopping, right? Yeah, yeah. So... Well, let me speak to that because, you know, I've been in the publishing industry for a couple decades and I go to, I teach at a lot of conferences and I always like to sit in on classes and see different styles. And I've sat in on a lot of query writing classes and they tell you the same thing. You learn the same thing in every class. You know what you're supposed to do, but that is so much different than actually doing it well, Mm -hmm. which is why I loved your class because we got to do it and we got to see it in real time why does this work? How can it be better? And just those small, minute changes can make something so much stronger. And so it was like, okay, now I see the practice of yes. it. And that's yeah. why it was so good. I, I had kind of this, a similar realization for myself where, cause I was going, there was a point in time when th- a lot more things were in person. I was going to, it must've been like a writer's workshop or a conference every other week. You know, I got wow. lots of invitations <laughs> and I thought, I'll go to one in every state and then I'll, I'll be the one person who can make that claim. And I covered, <laughs> I pretty much canvassed all of the U.S. except for like maybe Alaska and Hawaii. Um, but um, what I kept noticing in a lot of these writers workshops and conferences was they spent a lot of time focusing on all the things you can do wrong in hmm. a- in a query letter or mm. you know, writing a quick pitch or whatever. Yeah. And I thought to myself, no, I should help the students just focus on what they can do right. Nice. And, and to only have to worry about that. And it made the process <laughs> a lot simpler for them. Yeah. Yeah. And it kind of gives you hope because you do. I mean, there's a lot of negativity and it's a, a scary process writing a query. Like you said, you're taking a whole book and then you make a hook and a letter and hopefully engages right right i mean that's one of the reasons why i try to give the students a framework yeah then because it frees them up of not having to to think of it they can almost like a form or fill in the blanks they can work within that framework and and take what they need from their book rather than having to just try to conceive of it i mean mm-hmm. yeah Well, okay, we just said we don't like to talk about what not to do, but I'm going to talk about it. Okay. There were two Uh, things that I learned from you that I've uh, been telling everyone. And (laughs) I know, right? You're like, what's she going to (laughs) say? The the first thing is you learn to research the agent, find out what books are similar to yours, and then tell them because you agented this or represented this book, perhaps you'd be interested in my book. And you were like, you know, I already know what I represented. I assume you did your homework. 
right. and are contacting me because of yes. who I represent. So don't tell me what I know. We have one letter, so few words. And I was like, oh my God, that's brilliant. Everyone tells you, first paragraph, talk about the agent, tell them what they've done. And I appreciated your take on that. Yeah, I think it just, and also I said in the workshop, I think, I think, that just strokes egos. When I know, people, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, I came to work with you because I, I so admire the work you did with whatever, and mm -hmm. like that kind of. That's why, like, uh, people have. Does these, that like, not work though? Syndromes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. I mean, maybe it does work. I mean, but that speaks to the type of agent who you want to work with, right? I yeah, I guess, and I mean, yeah, you will have looked at their list and known those things, and then, like you said, it it saves you precious time in the letter to mm -hmm. get to mm -hmm. what you need to, and to save uh, space for other information, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, number two, so pitch sessions. There are pitch sessions all over the country. We have one at our festival, which, by the way, dear listeners, is October 8th. I'm just going to plug it. We are the official podcast of the San Diego Writers Festival. Again, that's October 8th in person. Go to San Diego Writers Festival .com. Thank you, Jed. Mm -hmm. And we always have a pitch fest. You know, we have three or four agents come in and I did it once because I thought, you know, I want to see what it feels like to do this. <laughs> It was mm -hmm. terrifying. We had oh, eight can you minutes. How it's like on the receiving end. <laughs> really? It's terrifying on your end too. Uh, you need an aspirin after a day like oh, that. Oh, <laughs> I can only imagine. My, I can only imagine. Yeah, totally. Like pitch after pitch. But here was the advice you gave that was so brilliant. And first, let me say how I did it wrong. So I, I got into the room and I gave my pitch and I dove in. I, you know, had it all memorized and it was like. I was like times 10, you know, I spoke for eight minutes. It was an eight minute pitch. So maybe I spoke for seven minutes. Mm. And then the agent just looked at me like eyes wide, like, whoa, that was a lot to take. What do I say first? Mm. And your advice was give the hook. Yes. Give just, the hook. Uh, yes. And stop talking. <laughs> yep, yep. Basically sit down, deliver the hook, you know, look the person in the eye, try and get a read on them and say, mm -hmm. <laughs> Does this interest you? You know, could I tell you a little bit more about my book and myself? Yeah. Do you have but, any questions? Yeah. I was yeah, like, oh can, my god, it's, it's brilliant! Like you can make the best use of that time that way. Like, you can you could spend it doing so many other things. Whereas, I think authors who sit down and just launch into a synopsis of their book, they're not really <laughs> doing themselves any good. Mm. Well, and what we have to remember is, Mark, you are a person. I'm a person. Yes. Like, treat each other like people, and yes, I, we're fallible human beings, right? And, and all that, and but I think, um, yeah, like it should be a conversation, right? And mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, I don't know. After a day of doing that, you become a robot. <laughs> I bet. Oh, I can only imagine. So, I mean, you're so giving, and I just sense that you're so sincere in that as well. It doesn't surprise me that you volunteer. Uh, tell us a little bit about the volunteer work you do for family centers. Uh, okay. Well, I, um, so I was sitting around during the pandemic working like everyone else, but I felt like I could be doing more. And, um, I had moved up to Stanford, Connecticut because like a lot of New Yorkers, there was a mass exodus where people were like, if I don't have to be in the office, why do I have to live in the city? So Right, I moved right. from the city to be near the beach and my, my uh, closer to my family up there. And um, anyway, I found I wanted to do some volunteer work and I thought I could do anything. I could work in a soup kitchen. I could do anything. Um, but I wanted to put my skills to the best kind of use. And I found there was an organization called Family Centers. And, um, bit, and I love how the, the name Kind of has a double entendre to it right it's not just a gathering place for families it's that's what families do for people it centers them mm, and yeah 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 nice. so i reached out to them and i said you know i see you you have people who tutor english you have these literacy volunteers i said i would you know i told them what i do and that that i i help with a lot of workshops and they said, we'd be happy to have you. And so I started 
doing that. I've been doing it for, uh, I think, around eight months or something like that now. And, um, you know, I'll see how else I can continue to help the organization. They're a big, you know, multinational kind of organization. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's good work. That's cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Thank you. I want to bring our readers into, well, into my mind and then reality. So as a writer, I sort of have this envision, you know, I envision this idea of what, what the room looks like where all the letters go, like the slush pile, right? We hear about the dreaded slush pile. And I envision this dark room and there's a whole bunch of interns and they're hunched over all these papers <laughs> and they're, and they, they grab a piece of paper and they read it. And then it goes into this huge black bin, right? Where it just gets tossed away and you never hear anything. Tell us what it's really like. Like, how many queries do you get? <laughs> What's it, that? It looks probably different than that now. <laughs> like, I think it might have been like that. that. Doesn't look like the depths of Mordor, because that's what I'm imagining. <laughs> that's exactly what I imagine. Yeah, when you like when you say slush pile, I picture like someone just like quite literally shoveling papers with a giant broom and <laughs> you know, going into like the corner of an office and then I don't know getting uh, swept away or. Maybe it's hopefully I don't whooshed know. into the bin. Yeah, like yeah. when you go to the hairdresser and they have that yeah. little vacuum that takes all the hair away. Well, now, now it. Oh yeah, and now it, <laughs> when they have that trap in the floor. That was always cool. Yeah, um, yeah. Nineteen fifties uh, vacuum cleaners. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, nowadays, so queries mostly come by way of um, you know the submissions form on the website, or which get delivered by email. And so we don't really have queries coming in by way of self-addressed stamped envelopes anymore, unless I actually get some of these on occasion. Um, I get a lot of query letters from co uh, convicts and, or mm. prisoners, you know, because in prison they don't let them use the Internet. They have to send letters by mail. Yeah. So if someone's writing a book from prison, that's the only basically self-addressed stamp envelope I get, unless someone's very, very, very old school. But, yeah, mm. nowadays... Uh, people go to the website, like they would go to tridentmediagroup.com forward slash submissions, and they fill out the form, tell us about them in the book, select the agent they want to submit to, and it, they the website generates a receipt for them. We get the email, and you know, uh, personally, I read it. If it's of interest, I re respond and request the manuscript. If not, you know, it's just like you said in Mordor, it just get, kind of gets incinerated in the lava. You know, uh, <laughs> fortunately, um, but people do get a receipt that we received it, and and it says if you know it, where it's of interest, they can be in touch. And then the website only bars them from resubmitting for I think like thirty days. So if they don't get a response or they don't have interest, they could always, you know, try a different agent at the agency or try with a new project. So hmm. you encourage yeah. that? Yeah. Very cool. But do you actually read the whole letter or? Do you read the hook? I used to, when I had a lot more time, I would, I would read the whole letter. Now I'm actually wow. in the process of hiring an assistant mm. for myself. So there are interns hunched over desks. Well, they, they're not going to be the ones reading the letters. I still want to read my own letters. They're mm. here nice. to free me up of, I would say, like the minutia mm -hmm. so that I can focus on working on yeah, reading the query letters, working with clients on their proposals and manuscripts, things like that. But um, now, mostly I skim through the letter. You know, if it's good, I um, I go right I go right to the author bio section, see what their credentials are like, then I reread the letter. You know, but it's got to, my point is it's got to grab you right away up front in those yeah. two sentences. That's what yeah. the hook is, and that's where it should be, because that's the experience of most agents. Um, Certainly at a big agency, we're getting like hundreds of queries a day. And, you know, if it's not grabbing us right or wrong uh, or in the right way, uh, excuse me, you, they just got to uh, delete and move yeah. to the next one. And um, Delete? Oh. I know. It sounds bad, but... You have to, though. There's no... And, there's, and it's very hard to respond to each one. I mean, mm -hmm. the website does generate an automatic response. I certainly... Mm -hmm make a response if I request a manuscript, but I find it's not for me, then I will make a personalized response. Um, but, but yeah, so um, that's why it's important that the query letter also be well written. It's yeah. the first opportunity for an author to showcase their writing. Yeah, yeah. 
Are there other ways that you find your clients? So sometimes I reach out to people like, um, you know, I, um, I'm trying to think of a good example, probably more recently. Um, okay. Here's a good example. I, I, I like to peruse Reddit from time to time. I like to, <laughs> nice. Like, it collects my news articles and just the funny stuff, you know, when you're bored or whatever. And there was this guy who made it to the front page of Reddit. He was a professor at, I think, the London School of Economics or something like that. But he taught in a really interesting area of um, of anomalistic psychology. So psychology that tries to explain paranormal happenings and anomalies. Like, it's not a type of science that tries to say, yes, ghosts and aliens and zombies are real. Instead, it's a type of psychology that says, okay, there are people in this world who think they've seen a UFO. How do we explain those people? Um, <laughs> so awesome. I thought it was a cool idea and something you could have so much fun with. And I reached out to this professor. He had written some academic books before. And mm. what I discovered was there were a lot of people lined up, publishers who have been asking him for years to write a trade publishing book on the subject matter for a general audience. So I hope I can say this on the podcast. If you have to bleep me, that's fine. No bleeps here. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so the title of the book is, when you say no bleeps, you mean I can't? No, you can, you, you can, can say whatever you whatever want. Whatever yeah, bomb. Yeah. Yeah. Drop the bomb. Yeah. Okay. So the title of the book is The Science of Weird Shit, Why Weird Stuff Matters. And basically, it, it goes into an exploration of all this. And he's he's a great media personality. He's been on, like, tons of shows about this stuff. Hmm. So, the yeah, perfect client. I, that year, I reached out to him, exactly. Did he say yes? Yeah, and we sold the book. We nice. Actually, yeah, so I think it was, I think it was a six-figure-plus deal. It sold to MIT Press. Hmm. Um, it, Very cool. It would be a fun and interesting book. So you peruse Reddit and... What about Twitter? So they, people say this all the time, and I find that they tend to be a little more old school. You yeah. have to have 10,000 followers on Twitter or an agent uh, won't even look at you. Uh, well, um, yeah, I go on Twitter mainly just to promote my clients, share the good news. Mm. Um, sometimes I reach out to people there. Um, but what you're referring to is certainly in the nonfiction space, you really need to have a big platform in order to appeal to publishers. And yeah, it's good if it's in the tens of thousands. It's better if it's in the hundreds, hundreds of thousands. It's really ideal if you have at least a million followers. So mm -hmm. I did a book deal recently for Ginger Minj. She's a famous drag queen and has been on um, RuPaul's Drag yeah, Race, yeah. movies and TV shows. She's going to be in Hocus Pocus too. Um, and, uh, she's got over a million followers, like across all her social channels. So, um, it was true easy. platform. Yeah. yeah. Easy to convince publishers of that. They see the built-in audience. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I look high and low. I mean, I, so I also go on like board Panda once a week and mental floss. Um, you know, I look at, uh, every week I look at the Ted talks to see if someone has delivered a new Ted talk that could make for a good book. Uh, I check the Amazon top 100. Um, I go on Nielsen book scan and I see what are the top 100 best selling books, you know, in the country in a given week. Cause you can't yeah. only go by the New York times list. It's not completely accurate. Although I do look at it too. Um, the New York times list in case it's interesting. Um, I have heard that they really look at velocity of sales rather than actual volume of sales. So basically someone from the New York Times who compiles that list calls all the major retailers, you know, Barnes and Noble or the major independent booksellers and says, you know, what's been your best selling title this week? And they tell them. And then they kind of grade on a curb, you know, or just use the rule of thumb to to figure out what might be the number one New York Times bestseller. So I can tell you many instances where the New York Times bestsellers list comes out and whoever's number one on that list, they're not always number one on book scan. Mm. Mm. And 
by turns, of course, the person who was number two on, or excuse me, number one on BookScan should have been number one on the New York Times list, but they're not. But they're not, yeah. How did so, you know that was one of my questions? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, it's an interesting mystery. It is, yeah. We just actually sat down and talked with the buyers at one of our boutique bookstores, and we talked about the whole algorithm thing and the secrets behind the New York Times bestseller list. It's fascinating. Yeah, it is very peculiar. I mean, it, and like when the whole ebook business basically hacked the New York Times bestsellers list, they had to then separate it out into like an ebook, an ebook plus print mm -hmm. section of the New York Times list. And then mm -hmm. the New York Times list eventually decided to leave off self published titles, it, it would seem, for the most part. Um, so they are kind of ex exclusory in their nature. Mm -hmm. um, which is unfortunate because they're supposed to report the news, not their version of the news. Mm. Yeah, we could really open up a whole can of worms <laughs> on that topic. Mm. Well, let's talk about self-publishing books. Do you, I mean, some people say that if you self-publish your book, it's the kiss of death. You'll ne never get an agent. You'll never get traditionally published. Yeah, it's a mixed bag. You know, I think early on in self-publishing, it was kind of like the dot-com bubble or, you know, Dogecoin or any <laughs> of those like wild things that happens with GameStop stock. You know, you had to have been there early on to really reap the benefits. And so there was a time in self-publishing where you could basically write a book, upload it to a server, and like the rest of the magic would happen almost all on its own. Now it's gotten to the point where there's just a glut of material, you know, it's a race to the bottom in terms of how the authors in the self-publishing space price their books. So you've got to sell, you can't sell them like they're Kobe beef burgers. You got to sell them like they're McDonald's hamburgers. You got to mm -hmm. sell thousands of them yeah. to make the numbers make sense. And uh, what happens is it doesn't always translate to traditional publishing because the audience doesn't follow the authors always or the, the pricing doesn't carry over into traditional publishing. So it, it, what it can do is it, sometimes it works well for authors and it still happens if it must feel like winning the, the lottery, but you really gotta be like a marketing expert to, to make it happen. It's not enough to be a great writer in the mm. self-publishing space. Yeah. And um, the other thing that I find happens too in the self-publishing space is you're, you live in that ecosystem. So you've got to just deal with whatever happens to you in that ecosystem because you're in one main like revenue tributary. It's kind of like, think of it like, uh, not to tell scary campfire stories or anything, but like, <laughs> you know, the frog that lives in a lake. And year over year, the lake's getting a little bit warmer, a few degrees, uh, one or two degrees, whatever, every year until the next thing the frog knows if fish populations around it are dying off the water's boiling why there's a giant nuclear power plant putting its cooling rods in the water called you know amazon and you know this frog like didn't even realize the temperature was being turned up on it right uh, right so you've got to be it's like in any kind of business you want to diversify your portfolio you want to be in other revenue tributaries like print and audio and getting your books translated and published overseas, getting them made into movies and TV shows, not just being in the ebook business and fixating on, oh, well, I have so much control over this and I have um, so much of the proceeds. Like, that's great. You have a lot of nothing. I'm mm -hmm. talking about having a little bit of something, you know? So that's what it sometimes that conversation takes place in trying to convince a lot of authors to move from the self-publishing space and traditional, a lot of them keep a foot in both sides of the saddle. Hmm. Um, and for those who did, who survived like certain kinds of disasters and like, you know, Kindle Unlimited and things like that, every time <laughs> the Amazon gods want to flip a switch, like scientists yeah. in the lab and then lives yeah. hang in the balance. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's totally true. And now we're only paying you for pages read. Yeah, that ruined a lot of people in, in the beginning. Well, now Kindle Vela is very interesting because people are making, authors are making money on bonuses and they're making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. 
And I know that that switch is going to get flipped, but right now that's an opportunity for, for these authors to yeah, get I some visibility. It, oh, I hope it works for them because, you know, if, if the sales numbers are good, you know, like if authors sell tens of thousands of copies of any given book that was self-published, it's definitely a justification for us to try and start something new for them on the traditional publishing side. Like mm. if definitely if they have a brand new standalone title or brand new uh, series, because publishers want to work with something that's then fresh and new on the marketplace, not like an ongoing series where, you know, or a book that had already published where the audience may have already been reached. Mm. Um, but yeah, if authors can do well for themselves in the self-publishing space, sometimes it makes a justification that we can move them into traditional. The only thing is, you know, again, it's just nowadays with the way things are in self-publishing, you know, the average self-published book in the lifetime of the book will sell like fewer than a dozen copies. And that's basically if your friends and family members, at least the ones who really care about you, you know, bought the book. And, you know, I can't go to publishers with that because they make, you know, an objective business decision about evaluating the author's sales track record before they acquire them. You're almost in a stronger position as a debut author because they can only really make a subjective decision about evaluating the writing and the story. Sure. Well, there's an argument you talked about marketing. And of course, as an independently published author and a self-published author, you are doing everything. And of course, you're getting help. I think self-publishing is a misnomer. You're not supposed to do it yourself. But if you are writing and packaging and publishing and then marketing, I mean, that's a lot of work. But then they oh, say yeah. to go with a traditional publisher, you still have to market the book. Yes. You still, you still have to be a marketer. I mean, that you just can't get away with not marketing well, your yes. book. Yes. Um, I agree with what you're saying with respect to, um, you know, in being in self-publishing, you're wearing all these different hats. You're mm -hmm. at once, not just the writer, but you're basically, because you're even if you're outsourcing this stuff, you still have to make these decisions and put all the pieces together. So you're at once like, not just the writer, you're like the, the editor, the book designer, the you know, cover designer, uh, marketing, publicity, all these other things. And every book you self-publish is not just a time investment, it becomes a, a financial investment. Mm -hmm. So like, if God forbid the next self-published book doesn't do as well, like you've spent money, you've spent time on it, and then it, it would be hard to sell to a publisher at that point. But I think with traditional publishers, they do all these functions. The difference is they free authors up in a way that the author can then become more prolific because then the publisher goes before the author and says, here's like three different, you know, design pathways for a potential book cover. Uh, would you just say yes or no to one of these? And that's way easier than going out, having to hire, you know, a cover designer, negotiate their fee, you know, all this stuff, you know. Um, so I find that authors who go into traditional publishing, they can still have the freedom that they would in self-publishing of being able to make decisions because we get all these consultations and approvals for our clients anyways in our dealings with publishers. But they're, all they have to do is say yes or no. They don't mm -hmm. have to you know, make a time and money investment. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you know this about Chad and I, but we design covers. Oh, cool. Yeah, we're book, we're book designers. And... I would say that, I mean, authors have this sacred cow. They have this vision of what they think their cover yes. would look like. And they're 99% of the time, they're wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you're, the thing is, is like, you're an author, you're not a book designer. Mm -hmm. But, and that's the one thing we see with self-publishing. Well, you're very bold to, to say that. but I know, true. but it's true. It's and, good. and you might make your work a little bit easier, you know, people sign on to that but i think you're right i think um you know it's as a writer you're so it's like you get stuck it's in your the baby weeds. yes it's your baby you're precious about it yeah. but also like it's very hard to have a ten thousand foot view of it right totally oh yeah totally and i think you know the cover designers have a certain sensibility of their own they they've seen and know what works well in the marketplace they know what maybe a publisher is looking for but i think it's good where they work with authors and and find what, what makes everyone happy. I mean, that's the best case scenario that the author feels good, the publisher feels good, mm -hmm. the cover designer feels good, and hopefully it wasn't a whole lot of work. Um, 
but uh, yeah. Well, this this goes back to your comparable title. So whenever we design a cover, we always place it on what is essentially a bookshelf, you know, next to the four other books that are selling right now that the readers expect mm. from your book. Mm. And that helps. That mm-hmm. helps. But yeah, it's, you know, it's an interesting line to, to walk when you're self-publishing a book and to separate yourself from the emotions of it and say, you know what, you're right. We're going to do this because it's going to sell books. Mm. Yeah, I mean, why else put work out there into the world unless you Give really best shot, yeah. or expect it to like take flight you know, yeah. from its yeah. own thing? Yeah. We are almost out of time. And I just want to ask you um, a couple more questions. But mm-hmm. talk to me about how audiobooks are changing the landscape of publishing. So... The audio business a long time ago was a very quiet sector of publishing. You know, it was like people didn't it's fully a understand. Funny audio. use of word quiet and audio, but anyway, go. Oh on. yeah. <laughs> no, but these were like so at one point they were recorded on audio uh, on excuse me on uh, vinyl, and then you could get audio books on like tapes, and then eventually CDs. And what happened was there was this rude awakening in book publishing where. I'll describe what it was like for me. Um, you know, I had I had run the audio department at, for a time at Trident and then was representing clients of my own at Trident. So someone else after me was running the audio department at Trident. And one Christmas, my sister, who's you know a lot younger than me, my dad had remarried, um, I gave her Lady Gaga CD as a Christmas gift. And she said to me, what am I supposed to do with this? Uh, <laughs> I said to her, are you That's kidding awesome. me? I, yeah, I should have gotten you a lump of coal. Like, <laughs> how, can you, how can you say that to me? And she said, no, literally, look at my laptop. There's no CD drive. She's like, look at my car. There's no CD drive. And I like, you know, my world started spinning because, you know, <laughs> I was like, I grew up in a world where I remembered a time when things were mostly analog and then when things were digital. And that's what happened to CDs. Things that kind of just mostly went away and it all turned to mp3s so mm. it it kind of changed the audio landscape in a big way concurrently you know publishers were under so much pressure from amazon and and basically how they were running their their businesses into the ground in some cases and um they just it was as though publishers colluded you know they just all quietly suddenly agreed nope we're all getting audio rights now it's <laughs> just we're just going to treat it like another format, mm-hmm. like, you know, getting the print rights or getting the ebook rights and they won't do a deal without it anymore. So it kind of made some sectors of the audio publishing business obsolete because there's nothing new for them to acquire. They just have to work with backlist or the rare exceptions. And so audio publishers, some of them had a freak out and they were like, well, we're going to get into other areas of publishing. So Blackstone Publishing, for instance, Blackstone Audio, for instance, became Blackstone Publishing. They started acquiring books because they knew they could they wouldn't just do the audio, they could try it in other formats. And audio publishers began focusing a lot more on acquiring backlists, trying to work with publishers who controlled the audio and didn't have the means to produce it all themselves. Um, but yeah, it changed the landscape of, of publishing in a lot of ways because mm of basically parallel events that were going on. Technology in the world was changing and publishers were, um, you know, under pressure from Amazon. It was affecting their businesses and they needed to find easy, quick, easy ways to generate, you know, revenue for themselves. Sure. I think it's also increased, you know, the number of people who are reading, listening to books. You know, people who don't have time otherwise can now- Oh, definitely. Hero oh, book. sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh, during, the, yeah go, go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say the pandemic kind of changed that because we don't yes. drive as much. But yes, that's what I was going to say. Uh, yeah. Early on in the especially in the pandemic, when people suddenly the supply chain issues caught on and people couldn't get books, certainly not from walking into a bookstore, let alone, you know, it was getting delayed in the mail. So a lot of people turned to, to both audio. books and digital audio. Hmm. That's cool. I love it. I think it's great. More opportunities for, I don't know, for learning about other people. And, you know, storytelling is such a beautiful, beautiful thing. And the more access we have to it, the better. 
Oh, definitely. And, and everyone who can, can enjoy, I love audiobooks because I mean, just from having worked in the, the audio department, you get so accustomed to them, but mm. you know, you realize storytelling began in kind of this oral tradition. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it adds a new layer. Uh, I know people who read while they listen, you know, so mm. yeah. I'm definitely a reader. I, I process the information differently. I think nonfiction is great for me to listen to. Mm. But if I'm reading a fiction book, I, I don't know. I just want to feel the paper and mm. look at the words. It's like it's a different kind of experience mm. to, to actually read the words. See, for me, audiobook was the only way I was ever going to get through Infinite Jest. True. Yeah. Uh, good. I'm, I'm not even going to get through the audio version. I've tried. Oh, fantasy so popular in audio because of how massive the books can be otherwise. And, mm. uh, you know, there was there have been times where th when I was younger, um, there was a book called uh, Permanent Midnight. Um, the uh, I'm forgetting the author's name now. It'll come back to me. They made it into a movie with Ben Stiller. I read that book in every format and, and just watched it in every medium. Mm. And saw all the different ways I could take it in and yeah. experience it in different ways. And it was kind of a fun experiment to read it, you know, not only in print, but listen to it in audio to see the movie, to, you know, come back to it one day as an ebook. It adds different layers. So true. I think you could say the same for Lord of the Ring. Lord oh, of the Rings, yeah. yeah. Mm. It reminds me, you said something earlier that reminded me, it took me back to my early childhood and we had, Peter and the Wolf on vinyl. Oh, uh, I remember <laughs> that. Yeah, like in my music class in elementary school. Yeah, we would listen to it over and over again. We didn't have a lot of entertainment when I was a child. So when you, we would get something, we would play it over and over. Right. So yeah, yeah, audio on vinyl. That's great. Well, <laughs> thank you so much for your time today, Mark. You've been really generous, as I knew you would be. And um, I just, I hope that our our listeners send you their pitches oh thank you so much i appreciate you both for having me this has been a lot of fun yeah so remind people how people can um follow you on social and i think it's tridentmediagroup.com slash submissions and where else can people find you online right so i'm at i'm on twitter at mark underscore gottlieb on facebook at mark gottlieb literary agent on Instagram, also at Mark Gottlieb Literary Agent. Um, and if you want to find me on the Trident Media Group website, uh, I'm there on tridentmediagroup.com, and, and you'll find me among uh, the agents there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you again. This has been another episode of The Premise. Visit us online at thepremisepod.com. Follow us on Twitter at pod premise and subscribe and rate us wherever you get your podcasts until next time. Thanks for listening. Hey folks, this is Jennifer. And as you know, the premise is the official podcast of the San Diego writers festival, which by the way is happening this October, October 8th, in fact, 2022 it's going live to be, and in person. Yeah, live and in person. I'm really, really excited. We um, we have so many exciting things happening. So many exciting speakers. They're coming in from all over, and we want you to be there. So Coronado Public Library, the fourth annual San Diego Writers Festival. San Diego Writers Festival dot com. You can subscribe to learn more about our programming and get on the list to win free books and all kinds of cool stuff happening. So San Diego Writers Festival dot com. Dot com. <laughs>